I'm Lucas Siegel for Newsarama.com. We are here at E3 2011 with James Olin, game director on Star Wars The Old Republic. So James, what's it like to come here with a fresh build, a lot of new content to show off uh, to these fans that, <laughs> well, this is press and, and exhibitors and they wrapped all the way around your booth. What's that like? Oh, it's really exciting. We have, we have added so much to the game since we last showed it off. We've like completely revamped the UI. Um, we've now announced Operations, which is our Elder Game content. Operations are basically where you have multiple parties working together to uh, defeat a very difficult challenge. It's something you do at the very end of the game. And um, our particular operation is pretty cool. You start off with your ship going down, you have to pilot an escape pod to the surface, and then you have to join up and uh, fight a whole bunch of uh, really cool things. So I won't give away everything because obviously it's the end of the game. So. Um, but yeah, we're showing off a whole bunch of new stuff. At this point in the game, everything's coming together, so every time we show off the game, we have something new to show. Um, and we're, at the, like, we're in full polish mode right now. Um, in fact, the game is playable from beginning to end. So right now we have, uh, we have all of our um, internal, uh, internal studio members, they're trying to play the game before we get to the next build, and before we get to a party wipe or a player wipe. So, but yeah, being at E3 is fun, it's exciting, and we're hoping, um, well, I won't even say, but this should be our last E3, and I can't talk about the release date, but um, you know, the game is coming together, and I can't wait to see, to have it in players' hands, because it's been testing really well, people are really enjoying it. When we get player feedback, they, a lot of them say they can't go back to other MMOs after playing Star Wars The Old Republic. But you know, you, you can't really know until you release, and that's what I want to, I want that game out there, so. <laughs> Now, we're seeing a unique positioning of both the light side and the dark side in this game, where you have the evil Sith Empire and you have the good Republic, but then players can actually choose to be light and dark, right? That's correct. Um, so, the fact is, you know, the Republic is, um, at its core, it's a good political organization, and at its core, the Sith Empire is an evil political organization. But the people within those two um, organizations they can be good or evil, they can make good or evil choices. Um, it just depends on what actions they take. So as a player, if you're part of the Sith Empire, you don't have to be evil. You can try to fight against the orders that you're given. Um, you know, you, have, uh, you always have the excuse, I'm just following orders. Well, you don't have to be that guy who says that he's just following orders. You can be the guy who tries to, tries to make a difference and tries to be good. good. So you can have a, a Sith warrior, you know, the Darth Vader style class, who's actually good and uh, very powerful on the light side of the force. And actually in one of our videos that we showed off, um, one of the Jedi Knights, if you're playing a Jedi Knight character, you actually have a chance to turn one of the Sith Lords to the good side instead of executing him. You defeat him in a duel, and then you can either choose to kill him outright, or you can choose to spare his life and bring him back to the Jedi Order for rehabilitation. And if you do that, well, I don't want to wreck everything, but there's a reward for it, so in a story sense, plus in a gameplay sense. Now, there are a lot of Star Wars fans out there who maybe I either don't play video games or specifically don't play MMOs. Um, how does this game open itself up to those fans that this might be their first massively multiplayer online game ever? Well, we've been very conscious of the fact that um, there's more Star Wars fans than pretty well any other IP in the world. It's a, it's a fan base that I think numbers in the tens of millions. Um, and so we want to make sure that our game is very accessible. When you get into the game, we don't want it to, we don't want it to feel um, opaque, where you, you can't get into the interface or you don't understand any of the game mechanics. So we've been very careful to craft the early levels of the game to be quite easy to get into the game. Um, but in addition, we've tried to get rid of the things that turn people away from uh, massively online games. And what I feel is the thing that turns them away is the grind. Um, basically when you're just doing boring activities over and over again, such as killing the same creature, you know, ad nauseum, or running for long distances across an open track doing absolutely nothing, or um, being involved in quests that are completely unexciting, not very epic, and are just presented in, as a wall of text. So, the way our story is presented is we have epic combat. You're never doing boring activities. If you're traversing the desert, you're doing that on a speeder bike. If you're involved in combat, it's epic. It involves lightsabers and blasters, and people taking cover, and grenades, and all sorts of um, visual effects. And if you're involved in a storytelling moment, it's a fully visualized, cinematic, fully voiced scene that, like, Maybe it could belong from like a Pixar movie. Well, maybe not quite that high fidelity, but you know what I mean. But it's up there, okay. Yeah. So, uh, with a game this size, this scope, we're talking about a game that's easily 8, 10, 15 times larger than any Bioware game before. Uh, what's it like coordinating that large of a group of writers and 
of developers and of testers and everything. Uh, what are some of the challenges of coordinating that scope of the game? Um, well, for me, it was uh, it was a it was definitely a growing experience because I was used to leading teams of designers that were you know a design team of say 15 guys, or even when I was um, up in Edmonton, we had a design department of 40 or 50 guys. Now we have a design group of like 80 guys, and we have an art group of 60 guys, and we have dozens of uh, outsourced out artists. So it's it's a huge amount of people, and we have uh, more than 100 um, quality assurance guys. So it's I can't give you the exact number of our studio, but we have a lot of people to coordinate. Um, so what it means is you have to trust your people. Uh, like you have to be able to empower the guys underneath you, and then those guys have to empower the guys underneath them. So you have to make sure that. Um, the project goals are being communicated very clearly, that everyone is on the same page to about what kind of game we're building, um, that they know what they're supposed to be doing, because if you you can't be micromanaging things. No one can be micromanaging things, or the game will never get done. So, And the good thing about that, though, is when someone feels, when a developer feels he has the freedom to make choices and do his own work, he's going to do a lot better work. So, in fact, I think in some ways, by having such a large team, I think it's benefited the overall quality because a lot of our guys have more influence over um, the work they're doing than they would have if they were working on, say, a Baldur's Gate or a Dragon Age or one of our smaller games. Okay. And finally, when the full game is out, what's the first class you're playing and why? The Sith Warrior, because Darth Vader's my uh, favorite character from the movies. And uh, yeah, just love Darth Vader. Nice and easy. All right, thank you very much, James. We appreciate it. Thank you. Stay tuned for much more from E3 2011.